summertime, summertime, love's in its prime. Summertime, summertime, everything's just fine. But up and came, up and came, turn love into shame. And love's a game, love's a game, no one's to blame. Who are you counting on? Who are you leaning on? When the cold winds blow strong, who are you counting on? As a horror writer myself, a thought has crossed my mind more than once. In the event of a horrible crime happening in my own atmosphere, could my own works of fiction be a catalyst in connecting me to a crime that I didn't commit? Could the grisly literary scenes I imagined and depict with my words draw suspicion of my involvement in a true crime case? Potentially, I'm sure it could. And I suppose any psychopath could twist my words into reality, use my ideas to harm someone, and then turn right around and frame me for the conviction. It's kind of a scary thought if you think about it. I'd be an innocent fiction writer, but I doubt the world would see it that way. Pending the details of the case, I'm sure the majority of people would think, of course he did it. The crime happened exactly the way he wrote it. It's an unfortunate situation that could very easily present itself in the world we live in and, believe it or not, this isn't a case that's waiting to happen. Crimes that mirror fictional works and in turn implement the author of that work as a suspect? Well, they already exist. Such as the case of comic book creator, Blake Libel. But hold on, this story is different in one terrifying way. You see, Blake Libel is no innocent man. I'm Mr. Black, and this is the disturbing truth about the full horror of what Blake Libel did. Buckle up, because this is going to get rough. Blake Libel was born in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, on the 8th of May in 1981. His family was a well-off family right up the tree. His father, Lauren Libel, is a well-known real estate tycoon and Canadian Motorsport Hall of Famer, while Blake's mother, Eleanor Chattel, inherited Allros products from her father, Paul Chattel. This company makes plastic polytarp materials and is reported to generate over 28 million US dollars in sales annually. But while grandfather Paul Chattel was a success, it was reported that he was known to be a control freak and bully. Paul's wife, Blake's grandmother, suffered from a severe mental illness of some kind. The specific diagnosis remains unknown. But what is known is that when Paul Chattel passed away, he left a will behind that withheld inheritance from his family pending not only alcohol and drug screening, but also an HIV test. Once relatives successfully passed these stipulations, Paul Chattel's girlfriend would get two Mercedes-Benz cars, a Cadillac, and some other parting gifts while Blake's mother got a payout of $12 million. Oddly enough, Blake's brother Cody Libel was cut out of the will with Paul Chattel stating that it wasn't out of lack of love, but rather that he knew Cody's father would adequately provide for him. On the other side of the family, Blake and Cody's father, Lauren Libel, was a man who dated beautiful young women and took them out in fancy Ferraris. He was the envy of any man who set eyes on his fortunes or female companions. When Lorne Libel split up with Eleanor Chattel, Blake lived with his mom, while Cody lived with his dad. It was during this time that Blake and his father reportedly became distant and estranged as Blake felt that Lorne wasn't providing enough for him financially. Even so, the Libel family was, by all accounts, a highly successful one. Even Blake's grandfather, Stanley Libel, was a well-known sailor who competed in the 1968 Summer Olympics and then later developed hundreds of homes across Toronto. Even Blake's aunt, Terry Libel, 
is a Canadian journalist who served as a host for CBC's Olympic coverage during the 1996, 2002, 2004, and 2006 games. Blake and his brother Cody Leibel were destined for success right from the very start. Or at least they certainly had the financial environment around them to allow them to succeed at whatever they put their minds to. As a matter of fact, when Cody Leibel moved to California, he certainly left his mark of success on the world. He even sold his 5,500 square foot home in Beverly Crest for almost $18 million in 2017. The buyer was reportedly Katy Perry. Then later on the same year, Cody bought Reba McIntyre's house for a reported $25 million, crowning him the youngest homeowner in Beverly Park history. This move made him neighbors with big names like Sylvester Stallone, Mark Wahlberg, Denzel Washington, and even Eddie Murphy. As the world's youngest owner of a Ferrari Enzo, Cody not only owned a record label, but he was a regular at a poker club called Molly's Game that reportedly hosted famous faces like Leonardo DiCaprio, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, and Tobey Maguire. Cody Leibel certainly seemed as successful as the family that raised him. Cody's brother Blake Leibel moved to California in 2004. He reportedly still received an allowance from his mother that totaled close to $2 million in just eight years. In 2011, Blake's mother Eleanor would die of brain cancer, leaving a huge inheritance behind to Blake and Cody. Roughly two years later, Blake challenged his mother's will to remove his father as trustee and deny his brother Cody his inheritance. But Blake, who reportedly didn't even attend his mother's funeral, received little sympathy from the courts. But who is Blake Libel? Well, he wrote and directed a comedy film in 2009 called Bald. It was very low budget and it didn't hit well at all. The movie was a massive flop with a 2.6 star rating on IMDb, but apparently you can still find it on Plex TV if you're curious. Here's a part of the trailer. I'm 20 years old, and I'm losing all of my hair. Come in. I can't live like this anymore. What do you need money for? So that I can get a hair transplant. You let a doctor cut open your head? Not just any doctor. I want the guy who did Matthew McConaughey. I wish I slept in here last night. Max, I'm gonna kick your ass. I'm going bald, OB. So, I had my first heart attack while playing with myself. That's not so bad. My mom and her bridge club found me. Blake Libel also directed a 2013 film called Soulmates, but I haven't seen it. He's even listed as a creative consultant and director on a few episodes of Mel Brooks' Spaceballs, the animated series, but again, this doesn't appear to be much of a success and the clips I've seen of the production fell short of sparking my funny bone in any way. Blake also released a comic book series called United Free Worlds that was about, well, I'll just let Blake explain that to you via a 2008 New York Comic Con video by Gorilla Wire TV. Welcome to the 2008 Comic Con. We are here. I am Emily Lazar. This is Phoenix. Hi, everyone. And we are here with United Free Worlds. You are a comic book company. Yes that has an amazing book out right now and it's actually a little bit di well you say that it's a little bit different from everybody else out here and why is that our work is slightly different because we take more time in making the artwork a higher quality we take a very extreme detail it's very serious to us and i guess that's what sets us above everyone else is that we like to take the time to really put in the extra effort because this isn't school there's no reason to rush this or do it the night before that's true so, tell us a little bit about the storyline. The storyline is about when a new planet enters our solar system, the Earth unites and we put down our weapons, 
and we find a new enemy that's about 12 to 18 feet and they ride and control dinosaurs like dogs and when we go to war they absolutely annihilate us the first time. To give you a small example, 50 pterodactyls connected to a big net open up and swallow in about 400 helicopters, carry them into the sky, and then cut that net like it was nothing and let that bag of helicopters fall to the ground. Now imagine, for a moment, being inside of that bag of helicopters. What would that look like? How would you feel? I'd probably be dead by that time. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So where did these dinosaurs and people come from? What world? They come from a planet called Cretor that has metals far, far stronger than any we have on Earth. They use dinosaur skin, bones, and teeth for all sorts of resources. They have wonderful, abundant fruits and big old Cretorian turkeys and chickens, but they're not called that. And it's just a very wonderful way of life. There are three different tribes run by three different ladies. One tribe is very much like Sparta, where the women have very little control. Another tribe, the women have a lot of control, and they get more fierce warriors because they're very emotional. And then one tribe has an equal balance between men and women, and from them come the greatest warriors and the most successful tribesmen, which does a little parallel into real life, which is that a mom and dad are very nice. <laughs> and are you the creator yourself? Yes. Okay, and you um, write all the storylines and everything like that? Yeah, we start off, we'll start with little rudimentary designs and sketch out how we kind of want it to look. Then it will go to some of the finest artists in the world, specifically Jason Raines did this book, who is just probably one of the easily in the top five best artists of all time. Tightest pencil work, finest angles. He's also the designer of the show Spaceballs for Mel Brooks, which is quite impressive. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to reading into United Free Worlds and look forward to hearing more from you guys in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. Take care. So, dinosaurs, aliens, helicopters, and extreme detail. Call me crazy, but Blake's behavior here comes across as erratic and, for some reason... It raises alarms with me. I mean, maybe it's because I know what he did, but to me, it seems like I can see the inner psycho peering out of him from a distance in this video. There's just something off about Blake Libel. In 2010, Blake published a graphic novel called Syndrome. Syndrome is about a man named Dr. Chattel, who happens to share the same name as Blake's own mother. In the novel, Dr. Chattel studies serial killers. He also goes as far as to recruit a town full of actors and then set up a fake Truman Show style scenario. Next, he fakes the execution of a serial killer before wiping his mind and allowing the memoryless man to run free in the fake town so Chattel can monitor his actions. The doctor's goal in the book is to cure serial killers. Chattel's character can be quoted saying that Evil is not some mysterious force. Evil is a syndrome. Co-author of the book Ryan Roberts stated that Blake told him that he had done a lot of research on serial killers. Ryan also recalled how Libel jerked his hands upward when showing how a victim could be flipped upside down in order to drain them of fluid. In hindsight, Ryan Roberts said he'll never forget that. While Blake didn't actually write or illustrate the final edition of Syndrome, he was credited as creator of the book, and he wrote an introduction at the start of the novel asking the question, if you loved hurting things, what would you do? Syndrome, Blake's biggest success, wasn't a massive one, and it ended up with him giving away stacks of the graphic novels for free at Comic-Con in San Diego. A producer said Blake wanted to be a respected comic book artist, and he used his cash to try and buy that image. He wanted to be cool and edgy, but he just wasn't. And it was obvious at that time that Blake Libel wasn't right in the head. His descent off the rails into dark madness had already begun, and people around him were starting to notice. But no one could predict just how far Blake would fall until it was too late for anyone to catch him. Parallel to working on these projects, Blake Libel had quite the romantic life. In 2006, Blake met a Californian model named Amanda Braun. 
Amanda was previously in a relationship with Andrew Altchek, who died in prison following convictions for crimes committed as a crooked hedge fund manager. After five years of dating, Blake and Amanda finally tied the knot in 2011. Not long after the wedding, Amanda Braun Leibel gave birth to a son. While the couple appeared to live comfortably in their Beverly Hills mansion, Blake continued to cash in and spend his checks pretty much as quickly as he received them. He reportedly smoked weed constantly and came up with various plans for success, but none of his ideas proved fruitful. During this time, one of Libel's friends said Blake was developing a dark obsession with brutal violence. It was like Blake was becoming a different person. He was distant and paranoid. Then in the summer of 2015, Blake left Amanda while she was pregnant with their second child. This was reportedly due to his pot-smoking habit consuming his life. But I'd say there was more than a marijuana issue brewing. Blake began isolating from almost everyone as he sank deeper into a world filled with gore, violence, and darkness. He even stopped returning his family's calls and began to suspect that his brother Cody was in deep debt to some Russian gang members and he was worried it could potentially bring harm back his way. But there was never any evidence that Cody Libel owed any major debt like that. And no one could understand why Blake's sanity was spiraling out of control, but most of his friends claimed it was initially the death of his mother that brought on this dark madness. Eleanor Chattel's $5.5 million home in Toronto, plus the millions of other dollars acquired due to her death, just wasn't enough for Blake. He was broke. And when he failed to have his mother's will overturned in 2013, he turned to his father to help him pay for his mounting credit card debts. Then Blake was sued by his lawyers for non-payment in the unsuccessful case of Eleanor Chattel's will. After Blake split up with Amanda, he began pitching another original script called Psychopomp. It was about a caped vigilante that cuts off the heads of villains and then uploads his antics to YouTube but reviewers of the script stated that it was terrible in every way possible. There wasn't one thing about Blake Libel's new project that anyone liked. It was likened to a bad rip-off version of Batman where Batman is violent, psychotic, stupid, sadistic, and highly unlikable. Psychopomp was simply torture porn without any sense of creativity. Nevertheless, it was rumored that Hilary Shore one of the producers of Children of Men, had picked up the Psychopomp script. But to my knowledge, nothing ever came of that, and I doubt anything ever will. While married to a pregnant Amanda Braun, Blake had started seeing Yana Kassian, a stunning 30-year-old Ukrainian former attorney from Kiev. In no time, Blake got her pregnant too, and for a while... They seemed happy and healthy as Blake pulled Yana into his fantasy world of Hollywood hot pink bullshit. All the while, his mental decline was picking up speed at a volatile pace. In May of 2016, Yana gave birth to a baby girl named Diana, and by all accounts, the new family seemed to be doing just fine. But they weren't. Blake was jealous of the baby and a storm of rage was brewing in his dark heart. He was no longer the center of Yana's world. Baby Diana was. And that pissed Blake off right up to a brand new level of psycho. He constantly demanded sex from Yana and threatened to leave her for another woman if she didn't comply. Yana sent her newborn to live with her mother a couple blocks away in another apartment paid for by Blake in order to focus on the couple's relationship. Then on the 20th of May, Blake Libel was arrested for sexual assault not far from his condo. The alleged victim was Blake's third girlfriend, Constance Bucafuri. She'd been living in another house he owned that was also a couple of miles away from his West Hollywood apartment where he lived with Yana. 
Constance claimed Blake forced himself on her in the house. Bukafuri is known for being a storyboard artist on Aquaman and working in the art department for films like Snow White and the Huntsman, P.S. I Love You, and The Emoji Movie. Technically, Blake was juggling three separate relationships, all of which were going about as well as his useless scripts. Blake Libel was released from custody around 15 hours after he was arrested, following a bail payment of $100,000. Yana had bailed Blake out of jail, but finding out about the affair with Constance was the final straw for her. She moved into her mother Olga Cassian's apartment nearby, leaving Blake alone. Four days later, while Yana was shopping for a new stroller with her mom, Blake started texting her. Sensing something wasn't right, Yana left baby Diana with her mother on May 23rd and went to meet Blake. On May 24th, 2016, Olga spoke to Yana for over seven minutes on the phone. But the following day, on the 25th, when she attempted to call her daughter several times, she never answered. Olga began to get worried. So at around 1.44 p.m. the next day, she and a friend went to Blake's condo to try and reach Yana. The pair noticed that Yana's car was parked in the garage of the complex. Olga then went to the front of the complex and saw that the sliding glass door was open up on the balcony. She shouted up for Blake to open the gate and let her in, but the only response she got was Blake's silhouette and his hand as he silently slid the door shut. She knew something was wrong. The worried mother called police, and two officers were dispatched to the location where they remained for two hours. The blinds in the condo were closed, the door remained unanswered, and the officers heard no noises coming from inside the apartment. The police called Blake and left a message on his voicemail, but he never returned it. The cops were out of options. They could do nothing without justifiable cause, so eventually... They had no choice but to leave. The next day on May 26th, Olga called and sent several messages to her daughter between 1.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. In one text, Olga writes, Yana, answer me. Are you alive, my dear daughter? I called the police because he is holding you there. I came over there and knocked. Answer me. None of the calls or messages were ever returned. Later that morning, Olga went back to the condo fearing the worst and called 911. She stated that Yana had just given birth via C-section and she was concerned for her daughter's medical well-being. When Deputy Micah Johnson arrived at the condo, he spoke to a neighbor who stated that they hadn't seen anyone in a couple of days. So at 8.45 a.m., the cops called Blake and left another voicemail, but still, it remained unanswered. Finally, an officer obtained a key to the apartment, and after his backup arrived, Deputy Johnson unlocked the door to Blake Libel's condo, but the safety latch was engaged on the other side. It meant someone was definitely inside choosing not to respond, or worse, they couldn't. The officers all agreed that there were exceptional reasons to enter the apartment, so they kicked in the door. When they entered Blake's condo, it was completely dark. They cleared the living room, dining room, kitchen, and the balcony. There was no sign of anyone. There was only one door left to check, and it was locked. The cops tried to force the door open to the bedroom, but a mattress was barricading the door from the other side. The cops shouted for whoever was in there to come out, and that's when Blake's voice finally responded saying he wasn't going to come out because he was scared that the officers were going to beat him up. They assured him that this wouldn't happen and that they were just there to check on his girlfriend to make sure she was okay. Blake replied back that she was fine. He said she was at the hospital and gave them a room number. He also said that his father would be there soon and that he wasn't coming out until then. Blake was referring to his accountant and mentor, Stephen Green. 
Blake had called Stephen around noon and asked him to come to the apartment. For a month before Stephen Green received that call, he had been unable to get in contact with Blake Libel. Green had called, messaged, left voicemails, and even emailed Blake several times, but he never got a reply. Stephen Green even left a voicemail on Blake's phone stating that he was worried about him and that he loved him. He said whatever was going on, he wanted to help him get through it. But as you're about to find out, it was way too late for that. When Green arrived at the condo, he spoke to Blake through the partially opened bedroom door in the apartment. A short while later, a detective arrived on the scene to find Green now in the living room, talking to Blake on the phone. Libel was still barricaded in the master bedroom. When Green hung up the phone, the detective asked him to call Blake back, to which he did. After a few minutes of conversation, Blake Libel finally agreed to come out. He was only wearing boxer shorts when he emerged from the room. Stephen Green gave Blake some clothing to put on. Luckily, officers checked the clothing first and found Libel's passport and about $4,000 in cash. It's thought that he was going to try and make a break for it, but that never happened. As the officers entered the bedroom, one of them screamed, She's on the bed. The detective immediately ordered everyone to go outside, and he called in the paramedics who were waiting on standby. Sadly, Yana Cassian was pronounced dead at 1.02 p.m. on May 26th. The following details are highly unsettling and extremely disturbing. This is how officers found Yana when they entered the bedroom. Yana Cassian's naked body was lying on a clean sheet and was covered by a red Mickey Mouse blanket on top of a blue polka dot blanket. Her head was on a pillow. There were abrasions and bruising on the left side of Cassian's face, consistent with blunt force trauma. There were human bite marks on Cassian's left jaw and left bicep, as well as fingernail marks under her jawline. Her scalp had been removed from around her eyebrows to the hairline on the back of her head. A large portion of skin on the right side of her face had also been removed. The skull bone was visible. There were cuts across her lower forehead below the eyebrows. There was also a cut on the right side of her face from her cheek to her jawline, and another on the left side of her face toward where the ear should have been, but it was missing. The medical examiner would later suggest that a bladed instrument had been used to remove the skin, but he stated that some of the tissue in the face had been torn away by hand. Based on the amount of injury to Yana's face and skull, coupled with the difficulty involving the combination of cutting and tearing, it was the doctor's opinion that these injuries would have taken a long time to inflict. It was also determined that due to the presence of inflammation on the tissue and hemorrhaging of several found severed samples, Yana Cassian was sadly alive while she was slowly tortured. The examiner also determined that there was no blood in Yana's heart, veins, or arteries. Half of Yana's blood supply was missing. This is highly unusual even considering the weight of her injuries. Gravity wouldn't have been enough to drain that much blood from her body. Her heart would have had to have been pumping the entire time. It was the medical examiner's opinion that Blake may have drained Yana's blood by placing her in the bathtub with her head lower than her feet, and then running water over her head, which could have increased the blood flow and potentially interfere with clotting. Due to the presence of foam in her nostrils, the doctor concluded that Yana was probably submerged in water for at least 30 minutes. Her body was then washed and placed on the clean sheet. Her cause of death was ruled as exsanguination, which is the draining of blood. There was an additional pillow to the left of Yana with an indentation on it. It was as if someone had been laying next to her. There were dried bloodstains on the mattress beneath the sheet she lay upon. The investigation revealed just how violent the events had become in the rest of Blake Libel's condo. Court documents state that bloodstains and human flesh were found behind the bed. Bloodstains were also found on the wall near where Yana was laying. 
part of an eyebrow was found on the floor by the bed. There were bloodstains on the mattress of a second bed, a side table, and in other parts of the bedroom. The mattress that had been blocking the door belonged to a second bed in that bedroom. There was a clump of hair and a bloodstained razor in the trash can. When cops entered the bathroom of the master bedroom, warm water was running in the bathtub. Bloodstains and hair could be seen in the tub. A green paring knife with blood on it was found in the top drawer in the bathroom. The oval shape of the bloodstains found on the headboard of the bed in the guest bedroom were consistent with having been made via the top of Yana's scalped head. There was blood on two towels, a pillowcase, the floor, and the base of the drapes in the guest bedroom. The drain in the tub of the guest bathroom also tested positive for blood. The same drain contained some freshly cut hair. Chemical testing also confirmed the presence of blood that someone had tried to clean up in areas of the dining room, the hallway, the guest bathroom, and both of the bedrooms. The kitchen garbage disposal also tested positive for blood. Then more evidence was found in the dumpster. Inside trash bags that had been thrown down the garbage chute, mere feet from Blake's condo door, investigators found blood-stained bedding, towels, clothing, bath mats, placemats, a bed skirt with bloody handprints, human tissue, including some pieces with hair that appeared to be scalp, and the missing ear. Samples taken from Blake's hand and fingernails also contained Yana's DNA. Yana's hands showed signs of injury consistent with self-defense. The marks and bruises seen on Blake's face when arrested were most likely inflicted by Yana fighting for her life. The LA coroner concluded that she was kept alive for around eight hours. He said he'd never seen injuries like that, and he likened them to wartime injuries. Blake Libel was arrested and charged with the torture and murder of Yana Kassian. It was later discovered that he used her phone to order food to the apartment via Postmates twice during the time Yana was missing. Blake's demeanor on the scene was described as ice cold. He acted as if he didn't even know Yana was dead. When an officer told him, he simply replied, Well, I guess you'll find out who did it then. Libel donned an evil grin as officers led him away from the condo in handcuffs. During Blake's trial, he appeared cold and remorseless. The prosecution suggested that Blake had killed Yana in an attempt to make it look like one of the scenes from his graphic novel, Syndrome. By viewing one page of illustration from the book, as well as the book cover itself, it's easy to see how they got that impression. Blake was tested for drugs but was positive only for a small amount of marijuana. Not even narcotics could be blamed for what happened, and all the evidence in the case pointed to Blake Libel. There was no question who murdered Yana Kassian. It's worth noting that the following year after the murder in 2017, Constance Bukafuri, the woman that accused Blake of forcing himself on her, had a restraining order filed against her by Blake's wife Amanda Braun Libel and his accountant and friend Stephen Green. They alleged that Constance sent them several threatening messages while continuing to stalk and harass them for quite a long time. Constance and Blake had started a business relationship in 2015 with their sights set on starting a production company. Somewhere in December, the relationship became romantic and Constance began living with Blake in one of his houses. Then in 2016, Blake reconciled with Yana and moved back in with her. After Yana's murder, Blake instructed Stephen Green to sell the house Constance was living in and give the proceeds to Amanda. This enraged Constance who felt betrayed, and on December 8th of 2017, she wrote in an email, I am ready to put a bullet through Stephen Green's head. She would continue to send messages like this about Stephen Green all through December of 2017, including one that read, I am going to pull the trigger on Stephen Green. Report me to the FBI. Do you want to find Stephen's body dead on your doorstep? She would also send around 200 threatening messages to Amanda Braun Libel. 
Constance was initially sentenced to three years and eight months in prison. Later, she would be diagnosed with an unspecified schizophrenia and psychotic disorder, a sleep disorder, and an alcohol problem. The court vacated the conviction and remanded Constance to a pre-trial mental health diversion program where it's reported she recovered and is now doing well. There's no suspicion whatsoever of her involvement in the case of Yana Kassian. On June 26th of 2018, Blake Libel was sentenced to life without parole. Due to the nature of his crimes, he was eligible for the death penalty, but the DA didn't pursue it, even though doctors deemed Blake not to be insane and they stated he was fit to stand trial. It took the jury just three hours to deliver a guilty verdict. Blake was also ordered to pay about $43 million to Yana Kassian's family. Cody Libel was present on every day of the trial. Blake's father never showed up. Yana Kassian had only been living in the United States for a couple of years before tragedy struck. She was working on becoming a translator. What happened to her was absolutely devastating. It was a crime with little motive outside of Blake's narcissistic desire to control women with his allowance. It was as if this aged, evil little boy had never been rejected. And once he was, or rather felt like he was, he couldn't take it. His ego collapsed, and he snatched away the life of his newborn daughter's beautiful mother in the cruelest way possible. I only wish tax dollars weren't paying for Blake to stay alive. I hope his conviction is never lessened on a technicality or the basis of some mental loophole. Personally, I'd have been alright with Blake being given the death penalty. What's the point in keeping him alive to further live off other people's money? Ultimately, he's a waste of space, and he always has been. My thoughts and sympathies go out to the family of the victim and the kids he brought into this world. It's important to remember that he left baby Diana without either parents. And one day, these children Blake fathered will start asking questions. And that's a complicated reality to try and comprehend. I can only imagine how it will affect them. I certainly hope they grow up surrounded by all the love and care in the world. And I hope they know their father does not define them. His part in their lives was merely biological. Blake Libel will rot in prison where he belongs, alone, with no one, nothing, and no future that will lead to any shedding of light in his direction. Then one day he'll die, forgotten by most. I imagine for Blake and his ego, this is the worst form of torture imaginable. And for that, I certainly hope so. I'm Mr. Black, and this is the disturbing truth.